Because as the head of innovation, sometimes people think that my role is to create some whizzy things, some shiny yeah. things, and and talk about you know whether it's flying cars or, or something else. Actually, my role is about solving problems right now and thinking about in the future what innovative solutions can help us deliver better value for our citizens. This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged News and Views this week. This week, we bring you a insightful interview from our newsmaker, Rakesh Shah, who's head of open innovation at Transport for London, TFL. He tells us what they've been doing in the innovation areas in one of the Western world's leading transit systems. I'm excited to also bring you Larnzell Harper later in the podcast for our second installment on our leadership development program. It's a great interview with Larnzell talking about some of the leadership traits that are necessary to grow your career in the public transportation industry. But first, as always, we take a look at headline news from the public transportation industry. One of my favorite rail services around the world is our United States National Rail System, Amtrak, and they have taken the first step to completely re-equip the Amtrak long-distance network that provides vital service on 14 overnight routes from coast to coast. Manufacturers have submitted ideas to replace rail cars for some of these world-famous routes, such as the Auto Train, the California Zephyr, the Coast Starlight, the Crescent, the Empire Building, and Southwest Chief. Basically, they're purchasing these long-distance train cars to allow Amtrak to upgrade and modernize the iconic and vital overnight services that link our nation's major cities. That's according to Amtrak board chair Tony Koskia. They're going to take the next step later this year by issuing a formal procurement request. Right now, they're talking to these um, manufacturers, and the funding for future purchases is being provided to Amtrak through that Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, which was enacted by Congress uh, in 2021. Koskia said, we believe in the future of our long distance service, and we look forward to enhancing the customer experience across the Amtrak network and further supporting U.S. manufacturing. Speaking of rail, congratulations also to our friends in the Chicago area. We'd like to follow up on some of our recent guests and Jim Derwinski, the CEO of Metro Commuter Rail in Chicago, one of the nation's largest uh, commuter rail systems, was our guest to kick off the year this year. And uh, they now have secured $204.1 million in competitive federal grants for Metro projects, the most by far in any year in Metro's history. The amount includes the largest discretionary grant Metro has ever received, $117 million for the next phase of the Union Pacific North Line Bridge Replacement Program. Jim Derwinski said, Metro had a phenomenal year when it came to winning competitive grants, and we credit our hardworking and supremely effective Illinois congressional delegation for that success. Uh, the haul in grants was in addition to the usual federal capital grant funds that are allocated to public transportation, and uh, they're going to be spending some of this new money on upgrading and making ADA accessibility improvements to several of their stations. So congratulations to Jim and the folks in Chicago. Also, an interesting note from New Jersey Transit, congratulations to them as January marked the 40th anniversary of New Jersey Transit c- assuming control and management of the operations of New Jersey's commuter rail network. They started their service on January 1st, 1983. Their first New Jersey transit trains departed to Hoboken and Penn Station, New York, with crews that were now officially New Jersey transit employees. They've made numerous improvements over the years. According to Kevin Corbett, New Jersey transit president and CEO, he said, uh, with a proud legacy behind us, an extraordinary team now in place, major rail infrastructure projects like the Portal North Bridge replacement project currently underway and 138 new multi-level rail cars beginning to arrive in 2024. The future looks very bright for this essential division of New Jersey Transit and most importantly for the millions of customers who depend on it every year. And finally, out of Washington, D.C., with a change in uh, party control of Congress, the House of Representatives, the American Public Transportation Association, uh, representing our $80 billion industry that directly employs 450,000 people and supports millions of private sector jobs, extended its congratulations this last week to U.S. Representative Sam Graves, Republican from Missouri, on being elected by the Republican Conference as the chair of the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, more commonly known as the TNI Committee. Chair Graves was most recently the ranking member of the TNI Committee 
And according to APTA, has a deep understanding of how forward-looking investments in infrastructure can fundamentally impact and benefit our communities, our economy, and Americans' daily lives. Congressman Sam Graves, now chairman of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. And now on to our interview with Rikesh Shah. Make sure you stay tuned to the end of the podcast to hear from Lauren Zell Harper, who is going to give us a talk on leadership. And if you like the podcast, make sure you like it on whatever platform you're listening to. Maybe leave a comment and share it with your friends on social media to help spread the news. You too can be a transit evangelist. This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged. And today I'm excited to have with us as our newsmaker guest, my friend Rakesh Shah, who is head of open innovation at Transport for London, one of the finest transit agencies in the world. Rakesh, thank you so much for being our guest today and connecting with us from London. Thank you for having me, Paul. It's lovely to be here. Yes, Rakesh was also recently on our Transit Unplugged TV show that we filmed in L.A. at the Commotion Show. Uh, Rakesh, that was a pretty good show. What, what have you done since then? Yeah, so we've had the holidays and I spent my holidays, the festive period, in India. It was lovely to spend some time, time with my family out there. And also I got a time to really understand the role that mobility is playing in the, in the multiple cities across India. And the role of mobility is critical, both for the movement of freight, but also for the movement of people. And what I'm seeing is that is a massive change from when I was in India four years ago in terms of the role that four wheelers play, the, the, the cars play, the role of electrification, both in the bus network and other forms of transport, but also how people are thinking about cycling and being more active. And also there's a recognition that more needs to be done on road safety. You know, sadly, I've heard there's about 400,000 deaths per year in, in India, and then that's a big, big priority for, for the country. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's good. I appreciate you giving us a little perspective on on what's happening in India. Now let's flip over to the UK, where you've worked there at TFL for almost 22 years now. Tell us about the agency itself a little bit and what your role is there. So Transport for London is the integrated transport agency for our city. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we're responsible for about 31 million journeys every day, 31 million trips every day in, in London. Our role, we report into the mayor of London, our role by 2041 is to have 80% of trips to be made by walking, cycling, and public transit. So there's a significant focus on mass transit and active travel. Are you saying 80% of all the trips in London? Correct, yes. Wow, that's quite a goal. And it's really important because what we want is we want a healthier London. You know, we want people to be more active. We want to reduce type 2 diabetes, obesity. We want people to be breathing in you know, right ears and challenges around respiratory diseases. Um, so being active is important. The role of mass transit to reduce congestion and to keep the city functioning is critical. But also the role that mobility plays around economic growth and jobs creation. You know, and putting all of that together, it means that we have to get to that 80% target. That's something. Um, and uh, tell us about your role there and some of the highlights of what you've done over your career. You've had quite an illustrious career at TFL. Yeah, it's a fantastic agency, and it's a, and my role is fantastic. So as a head of open innovation, th- there is so much we're involved with. But, but fundamentally, there's two or three things that I'd like to say in response to your question. Firstly, one's open data. And, you know, six, seven years ago, actually longer than that now, I was responsible for open data at Transport for London. And that is about how do we unlock some of our data and make that openly available to the market and let them create fantastic products and services that helps run our network better. And as a result, we had, we've seen over 700 apps, 17,000 users, and people are creating apps for customers. People are creating apps for operational purposes. And as a result, we're working with those brilliant 17,000 people to solve some of London's challenges. And we were enabling people to create products, niche innovative products, to help people be, choose their channel of choice to move around our city. So that's one. And the second thing is, as a result of that, we created the Open Innovation Hub. And the Open Innovation Hub is very much about how can TFL be one of the leading public sector agencies in the world that enables the market, whether you're a startup, a corporate, an academic institute, a venture capitalist, 
to be able to use London as a platform to create more innovation. And as a result, if we can do that in London, where it acts as that test bed, it means that not only do we create value by doing things better, cheaper, and quicker, it means other agencies across the world and other cities across the world, world could use those products too. And as a result, I've been really proud of the work that we've done in the Open Innovation Hub in, in our city. That's wonderful. You know, there's a lot that we can do with technology. One of the things that I know you all are proud of at TFL is really, for the Western world at least, kicking off the tap-and-go credit card system uh, there where people can do contactless credit card. I remember being there, visiting uh, with TFL back, it must have been um, six years ago, maybe seven years ago, when you had just implemented that. And uh, I uh, I got to meet with your uh, one of your head folks there and took me down and showed the um, how in six months, 40% of the people were using that on the tube. It was really um, a fast uptick in, in that. So innovation plays a big role in a lot of areas, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, thinking about the history of innovation at, at TFO in London, it's not a new thing. You know, if, if, I, if I go back even further, beyond six or seven years to 1863, <laughs> just... just yeah, just yesterday, I'm delighted. Yes. So we've just celebrated the 160th anniversary of the tube. That's right. And, and, and that started with innovation. You know, if yes. you think about the problems that we had in the city then, above ground, we had congestion and some of the disbenefits of congestion. So Charles Pearson, who's the brainchild of the tube in that time, said, we need to find a new way. And the new way was to start digging underground. So we started to build tunnels and near Baker Street, we built the first metro service in the world. And as a result, we've seen the impact that metros now are playing across the world uh, and, and the value they're creating. And, and, and similarly, around the same time, we've created the first traffic lights in the world in London. And, and the point being here is bringing it to the modern day, whether it's smart ticketing, whether it's open data, whether it's the Elizabeth line and some of the innovations with the Elizabeth line, or whether it's um, some of the intelligent transport systems that we're seeing on the surface transport network. It's continuously about defining what the problems are, working with the customer, and the customer is really important here because when we ask our customers what you want from London and transport, they say three things. They say, every journey matters, so I want to be getting from A to B reliably, I want to be getting from A to B safely, securely, and all the things that you'd expect a good transit agency to provide. Secondly, I want value for money. I want to make sure that if I'm using mass transit or I'm using active forms of transit, I feel like I'm getting value. But finally, and most importantly in the context of my role, they want London to be progressive and they want us to be innovative. So that's something Londoners are asking us all the time. So when I think about what problems are out there, it's really important to put the customer at the center of that because ultimately we're serving our, our citizens, whether they're visitors, or whether they're residents. So, so as a result, it's really important to frame the question that we have is what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Because as the head of innovation, sometimes people think that my role is to create some whizzy things, some shiny yeah. things yeah. And, and talk about, you know, whether it's flying cars or, or something else. Actually, my role is about solving problems right now and thinking about in the future what innovative solutions can help us deliver better value for our citizens. And that means that all those innovations we've spoken about, smart ticketing to the first tube service, is we've got to be much more human-centric around the problem that we're trying to define. And it's critical to provide a transport service for all because our job is to do that. And it's bringing those voices around the table and contextualizing the problem. Then bring in other people, whether they're suppliers, whether they're other key stakeholders to say, how do we co-design the solutions? And then it's about testing and it's about iterating and it's about learning and also closing things when they're not working. And then ultimately out of that, there'll be some things that really work and some things that you should be scaling a bit further, but do that in an iterative manner. And ultimately that's how you start bringing some of the solutions in. Um, and, and that's where you create the value. As we talk about um, customer-centric 
uh, operations. Obviously, that's really coming out of the pandemic. One of the things I think we've all learned, right, is to put our customer first. Uh, what I know that you're hearing the same thing there in London that we're hearing across North America, which is a focus on sustainability of our operations, a focus on equity and inclusion, ensuring that everyone has an opportunity to utilize these to improve their lives, and really then how to connect and enhance journeys. Technology plays a big role in those. Can you speak to any of that? Yeah. And and, and I think it goes back to that earlier point, which is that technology should not be looking for the solution. You know, or it should be the problem that's looking for the right solution. Because sometimes we try and retrofit a technology and say, yeah, it can solve this problem. So I, I think if we want to achieve our sustainability goals, looking, in, looking, uh, looking ahead, we've got to bring innovation thinking into this, into this, uh, into this whole system. And as a result, the innovation doesn't just have to be the technology. It could be the processes, it could be the people, it could be, uh, it could be the, the products, the technologies. And, uh, and I think where we need to play a bigger role, and let me give you one example, is we were recently working with Bosch, and we were also been working with Daimler. Actually, I'll give you two examples, if I may. And, sure. and, the, and the Bosch one was, we were testing a hypothesis, which was, if we've got Brixton High Street, which is in South London, and it's quite densely populated. And what we wanted to test is if you held traffic back away from the densely populated area and it's smoothly flowed through the densely populated area, what impact is it having to the air that you're breathing in? And that was the exam question. And what we found is when it came to the innovation in the sensor space of what, what, how you can accurately measure what's going on, a lot of the sensors that were out there were at a macro level. And that gave you a good holistic view of what's going on in a particular area, but it didn't give you the view at a hyperlocal level where you're breathing, actually breathing the air in. So what we started to do is we worked with Bosch on an R&D basis. And we said, could you give us that data of what Rikesh Shah, who's five foot seven, is breathing in at this particular location? So we started to test these new forms of sensors, but that wasn't the only thing. Then when you start thinking about air quality, you need to understand the typology of the buildings in the area. You need to start understanding the weather patterns. You need to start understanding the, the types of vehicles that are actually going through at a given junction. So we did this and we brought Bosch together with King's College London, with Here Maps, with multiple other players. So this is where we're doing a co-collaboration piece to solve a particular problem. And what we found is... We got some things wrong at the beginning where the sensors in the wrong location, the sensors weren't working quite right. But after some iteration over a series of weeks and months, we got the right model. And what we found is it actually reduced the exposure to bad air by 20% by doing this experiment. And as a result, we are now applying this same principle, the same model now for a series of traffic light changes, hundreds of traffic light changes across London uh, based on a similar road layout. So that's an example there of Starting with the problem, testing, trialing, but also think about how do you scale it at the end so you create sustainable value and benefits realization. So that's one example. And if I may, if I could give you the other one. Yeah, that's interesting. Give me that other one. Yeah. So with Mercedes Benz. So there are thousands of Mercedes Benz in London. And, uh, and in London, tragically, we had 73 deaths last year on the road network as a result of road collisions. And what we wanted to know is not just responding to those road collisions and seeing what innovations you could bring in, but also seeing how do we better predict and risk profile where an incident may take place? Because that's where how you can get to vision zero. And what we're doing with Mercedes and, and others now is an average car has over 100 sensors. And based on those sensors, you know where cars are suddenly disproportionately accelerating, skidding, swerving, entering slippery surfaces. And what we, the experiment with Daimler was, could we better risk profile where a road collision may take place? And as a result, we can put the right interventions in place before they actually happen in terms of incidents. And we found some insights that we didn't know about before. So as a result, we're now rechanging potentially road layouts and other things based on the Daimler data. And also as a result of that activity, we are now working with cycling groups, we're working with fleets and others, and you're now aggregating a picture of London where you could better invest your road safety investments 
Trojan and help us get to vision zero. So two very different examples, but examples of where we're trying new innovative ways of, of adding value to our city. So let me ask you, where, where do you uh, take your innovation inspiration from? Uh, do you look to other cities across the world? Do you look at the problems that are coming up uh, at TFL? Are there other organizations or people in the world you think that are doing it right? So my inspiration comes from multiple multiple sources, and it could be other cities, it could be other industries, um, or, or or it could even be um, internal colleagues. You know, it, it comes from a wide range of sources, and 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 I think the fundamental point here is that TFL can't do everything itself. You know, where and as a result, there are some fantastic startups across the world. There are fantastic corporates across the world academic institutes, venture capitalists, accelerators. My job is to act as the curator. My job is to get much better at defining the problems and let the market stimulate the innovation. And then I need to create the conditions internally that allow us to effectively test and ultimately scale and get the benefits realization. So answering your question, where I get the inspiration from is when we best define our problems and we go out to the market, whether it's one person that's just created a brand new product or whether it's a large corporate that's investing its R&D investments, having those conversations is when I come back and say, boy, there is so much out there that can create value for us. Let's, let's change that culture in my business. Let's find those right people that really want these problems solved. And let's think about doing things better, cheaper, and quicker. And every time I have conversations like I'm having one with you, or other people in the market, I can be clean my own organization and say, there's another good idea here. How do we bring it in and how can it add value? But it's not innovation theater. It's about solving problems. My last question to you is the flip side. What do you see as barriers to innovation? Yeah, and, and I think the public sector in particular has quite a bad image when it comes to innovation. That's right. And, 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 and some of the cultural barriers could be procurement, you know, how do I procure with you? you know, you're going to be dragging me out for three years here and I've got a runway. Or it could be culture, which is the fear of failure and being risk averse and not being able to try new things. Or it could be you're going to take all my IP away, you know, all my intellectual property rights uh, and so forth. And that's what we've tried to sort of address in the innovation hub. Yeah, it's how can we make it easier for innovators to work with us? How can we make it easier for innovators to be able to do some R&D with us, but to ultimately do business with us at scale? And, and that means that we need to create the right conditions internally. And as a result, there are people that love working with the Innovation Hub. There'll be some people that will see it as a, a, bit of, a bit of a threat or a bit of a waste of time, frankly speaking. And my job is to make sure that the Innovation Hub is acting as an enabler and Ultimately, how can it change the culture within my organization in my city to say everyone within the organization should be entrepreneurial, everyone should be allowed and should be being innovative, everyone should be allowed to fail and be given ear cover. My job is to make sure that I put the right controls in place and the right ear cover in place. But ultimately, I think we need to make sure that the public sector, which spends between 16 to 25% on average of GDP, is getting better value by co-developing, co-creating with the private sector and ultimately creating more citizen value. And, and that for me, without getting too philosophical, is we need to reframe capitalism here. And we need to better work with the public and private sector to drive more social innovation and ultimately find a way there's a win for everyone, whether it's you're a startup, whether you're a corporate, or whether you're the city. And at the moment, the relationship between the public and private sector is too transactional. Wow, that's great. I'm glad I asked you that question because <laughs> that was a really super answer. Rakesh, thank you. thank you so much for that and for this interview and for the work you've done, not only at TFL, but for our industry and helping uh, to kind of be the point of the spear on many of the innovations that have occurred in our industry. And, and, and as well, one more point, if I may, yeah, sure. if you don't mind, is the other thing that we need to get right in our industry is, and so point very close to my heart, is around inclusivity. And uh, there's two angles that I'd like to comment on it, uh, which is firstly, when it comes to innovation and technology, we need more diversity in, in, our, in our industry. And, and, and by that, I mean, we need more 
women in leadership roles. We need uh, people from a, a black minority ethnic background. We need more people with, uh, who have a disabled background and, and, and so forth. And we just don't have uh, enough diversity. And I think that's because traditionally innovation has come from the engineering world. And as a result, young women may feel that engineering's not for me and they're going to run their industries. So we're spending a lot of time now as a team going out to schools on an outreach program, our graduate scheme, and, and, and creating a series of programs which says that innovation is for everyone. And I'm really delighted that, you know, I have a lady in my team, Theo Chapel. She's one of the best innovators when it comes to transport. You know, she, she had a key role in open data. She's playing a key role in the open innovation. And we need more people like her to stimulate the next generation of innovators and act as role models. So I think that's something we need to address and do more as an industry. And the second area is diversity of thought. Is when we're solving problems, how do we bring different uh, diverse audiences to really think about the problem and think about the solutions from a much wider perspective. Otherwise, we'll have a very biased perspective. And as a result, the solutions that will come in could just be very single-minded. And, and I think we need to be much, much better at bringing diversity, trying things, and then coming up with the right solutions. Because ultimately, we're, we're, we're focusing on transport for all and, and a city for all. And that, that means that we cannot lose, lose this perspective. What a wonderful way to wrap it up and a great perspective. Thank you, uh, Rakesh Shaw, Head of Open Innovation at TFL, and uh, best wishes to you as you move into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Hi, I'm Alea Carey, a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. If you're looking for affordable and effective marketing tactics to reach a broad audience, you might want to consider using direct mail. Direct mail means third-class mail, which is to say it's less expensive postage than first-class mail. It's sent to specific addresses in your region. There are many forms of direct mail, including letters and envelopes, but two-sided postcards are the most effective for reasons I'll detail in a moment. To develop a direct mail piece, choose your marketing goals. Do you want to raise awareness, build ridership, promote new service? Keep in mind that direct mail is probably the very best way of promoting new service or building ridership because you can include free rider passes in your direct mail piece. Next, write your marketing copy and design your direct mail piece. Maybe you can do this yourself, but you can also get help from a designer or a local printer. You can also work with a local printer who will both print and mail your media to addresses you choose from the USPS website. Two-sided postcards work very well as direct mail pieces because you can be sure that even if your recipient throws away your mailing, they can't avoid seeing your message. The good news is that most recipients don't throw away direct mail right away. Also good news, a wide variety of age demographics have a positive response to direct mail. The tactic is especially effective in reaching both millennials and baby boomers, and that's rare. If you'd like to talk more about direct mail or anything else related to communications and public transit, look me up on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. We hope you're enjoying this episode of Transit Unplugged, the podcast. How would you like to see behind the scenes footage of the agencies that Paul visits? Then be sure to check out the new Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube, where transit evangelist Paul Comfort dives into the culture, the food, and the transit of major cities around the world. You'll see the operations control centers, how maintenance shops work, and the latest innovations taking place at agencies around the globe as we work together to improve the lives of our transit riders and our communities. Be sure to subscribe to Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube or at transitunplugged.com. Thanks for sticking with us today on Transit Unplugged for our brand new feature this year of 2023, where we're taking a moment every other week to reflect on leadership. So many of you have mentioned to me that in your career, getting a mentor or some leadership training, and even listening to people on the podcast who are leaders has really helped you in your own career. And I wanted to take that one step further this year by interviewing and talking with people who I have, um, uh, who I think highly of in the areas of leadership. And one of those uh, folks is Lauren Zell Harper. Lauren Zell is manager of training and development at Via Metropolitan Transit Authority in San Antonio, Texas. Lauren Zell, thank you so much for being with us today on the podcast. 
You're welcome, Paul. I'm uh, I am so happy to be here. I'm excited. This is uh, something I've wanted to do for a long time, and I'm happy. Very good. Well, today we're going to talk to you about three important topics when it comes to leadership. Uh, Larnzell, in addition to being a trainer at a transit agency, you, you've you spent quite a bit of time getting trained yourself and, and giving leadership talks like I've done over my career. Tell us a little about yourself and your background in leadership. Uh, background in leadership actually started as a bus operator at Chicago Transit Authority. I can uh, never forget, I can still remember as clear as day, walking into the training center the first day and seeing the manager and saying to myself, that's the leader I want to be, uh, become because he was so friendly. He greeted us and I just thought it was a special touch. So from there, I went from operating a bus there. I went to uh, developing and writing, creating training programs to actually being a manager in bus operations. And then fast forward, I'm actually a uh, manager of training development in San Antonio, as you mentioned earlier. That's great. And you, you've taken a special interest in leadership development, haven't you? Absolutely. Uh, Leadership development has a special place for me because of the mentors that I've received at transit agencies. And I always like to say uh, we as leaders, we probably won't be where we are without mentors in transit who are there before us and uh, with us and before us. That's great. You told me that you've got three main areas you like to focus on, and we're going to talk about those today, and they are decision-making, how to make good decisions, right? We are, we're always faced with uh, a fork in the road, you know, as Yogi Berra said, and so <laughs> how correct. do I make a decision about which way to go? And then uh, agility and the importance of agility in leadership, and I, which I think is so key. I agree with that. You know, I think we should write our purpose in pen, but our way to get there in pencil. We have to be agile to get to our goals. And then finally, uh, the importance of equity and inclusion uh, and how that can help in leadership development. So let's dive right in, Larnzell. Tell us about how to make good decisions. So like, Paul, I, I love this question because you can't be a leader without good decision making. And what I see works best for transit agency, s- seek the best solution. But the best solutions are based upon experience, And sometimes it's so easy for us to kind of subscribe to this belief. Well, we've always done it this way. Well, what works? And I'm not saying that as a leader in transit, not to do what we've always done or what works. However, when you're doing that, when you're making your decision, are you assessing possible outcomes and ideas based on this accurate data that is relevant? And what I mean by accurate data that is relevant even though we can always call different agencies up, hey, what are you all doing in Chicago? Well, what works for Dallas? You just have to make sure that that data you're collecting is relevant. And something else too, I really uh, would like to stress that leadership requires us to have this awareness. It's like sort of like this pilot light that always remains on. Avoid the trap of trying to remain safe and indecisive because it is so easy as a leader to find reasons to avoid making the decision rather than just absolutely maybe making a mistake. But even with that mistake, you made a decision. Yeah, I find that uh, there there seems to be, especially in government, a great fear of making mistakes. Uh, and th- so that oftentimes leads us to make decisions based on the lowest common denominator, the decision that everyone agrees on, which may not be bold and forward thinking. It may just be safe. What do you say about that? I think you have to really kind of just go back to, am I remaining safe? And if I want to remain bold, what data have I collected that supports this decision that is bold and innovative? Will this bold and innovative idea for leadership work? And I really believe with the accurate data that's relevant, you can go forward with that idea, although it's going to be scary. That's good. I read a book one time by a guy named Roger Van Ork, and it was called A Whack on the Side of the Head. It's easy to remember that title, right? Uh, yes. But there's so many great leadership principles in that book, I think. And one of them that I took out of it was that uh, so often we stop searching for the right answer to make a decision on the first answer that seems to work. 
And we don't continue to think. Uh, it's almost like, you know, hey, you stop looking for your car keys once you find them. You don't keep looking for them because you found them. Yes. Well, that same mentality oftentimes hampers us from making more elegant decisions because we stop at the first answer that we think ant- that we think solves the problem, but we don't continue to look for another right answer. And it's sometimes that second right answer that's a more elegant, complete solution. What say you? I agree with that. I agree because what, uh, from what I'm hearing from that, what you're saying, Paul, it kind of is like, uh, it's a, I've spent a lot of time in training. And so a lot of leaders in transit will use this. It's a toolbox. You know, you can't repair a car and refrigerator using the same tools, but you're keeping all of those in one place. And so you're, you're exactly right. As cliche as it is, you have to have a toolbox of how you're going to get solutions to any problems you have. And I think that's the key to leadership with decision making. What's in your toolbox? And that leads to our next point, which is agility. Yes. Tell us about agility and decision making all and right. leadership. So agility is something that every leader, rather it's transit or government public service, you're just going to have to face this. And to me, agility is, as a leader, it's relying on not just one skill, not just a skill, but a combination of skills that are working together at the same time to help you as a leader make effective decisions. Because let's face it, transit is an ever-changing world of agility. And if you can adapt to that agility, then that's part of your development as a leader. And let's, let's break it down. What is agility? Agility is adversity. It's hardships. Uh, how many have we heard this phrase, a curve ball of life? It's almost like uh, you, you come to work and you make this plan and you're not expecting something to happen. But when you develop those combinations of skills to face this type of, to be prepared for agility, then what is a curve you weren't expecting, but you're able to just knock it out the park. And something else with transit, I mean, we're seeing some different things infrastructure needs, uh, operator staff shortages, um, how extra board assignments are going to continue, ridership. I mean, that's just a few examples of how transit leaders can practice agility. Very good. So um, the last one you wanted to talk about today was how someone could promote equity and inclusion in their current role, and how does it help in leadership development? Yes, uh, I, this is uh, something that uh, a lot of leaders should consider if they're not already doing this in the workplace. The best way to kind of meet that, promote equity and inclusion, seek practices in your workplace that meet the unique unique needs of your workplace. However, without giving one person or group an unfair advantage over another. It's a challenge. Yes, it's going to be a current challenge to look at your current workplace practices and see which rules, which policies are benefiting some and harming another. So it's, uh, it's, it's as a leader, especially in transit with what we're seeing happening now in this current time, it's remaining firm, but understanding this is a long-term commitment that is going to come with many, many, many challenges. That's good. Um, and the last question I would ask you, Lorenzel, is if we're if you're talking to a mid-level manager in Kalamazoo today who wants to move up in their career in a transit agency, what advice would you give them? Best advice I would give to a mid-manager in Kalamazoo is to seek a mentor. Again, most leaders that you're seeing on LinkedIn and transit at APTA, NTI, uh, Transit Summit, uh, you just name it, um, any type of event that has transit agency professionals and leaderships together, most of the time they got there with a mentor, a mentor who showed them, advised them, and just gave them good, solid advice to help their career or personal life move forward in advance. That's great. Lauren Zell, thank you so much for being with us today as our second uh, trainer on leadership development for the transit industry skills. We wish you the best in the work you're doing there at VIA with a great group of leadership there, by the way. Your leaders and your agency are good friends of mine. And uh, thank you for being our guest today on Transit Unplugged. And I wish you the best in your continuing development as a leadership developer at work and beyond. 
Paul, you're welcome. And this was an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Trends of Unplugged News and Views with our special guests, Rakesh Shaw, Head of Open Innovation at Transport for London, and Lauren Zell Harper, Manager of Training and Development at Via Metropolitan Transit in San Antonio, Texas. Next week on Transit Unplugged In Depth, we have Kate Matice, Executive Director of the Northern Virginia Transit Commission. Now, don't forget... Go to transitunplugged.com to sign up for the newsletter so you're always in the loop with whatever's going on with the show. But if you also want to email us, you can do that too at info at transitunplugged.com. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.